Hello. <laughs> uh, this talk was given actually at Biddle, so if you were there, I apologize, but this is going to be an encore presentation. Um, so my name is Jen. I'm the one of the co-founders of Saga, and today we're going to talk about the magic of horizontal scalability and using um, horizontal scalability to get uh, quote unquote infinite performance, um, essentially in the next bull run when people need more. Uh, performance from their applications. Uh, before I start though, um, something that's interesting that I just realized in this building, um, this is where Terra actually started. So this is actually the first the first time I came to this building was to meet uh, with a doe actually. <laughs> I don't know if you know this. <laughs> so I thought that was an interesting uh, blast from the past. But So let's talk about the history of horizontal scaling. Um, horizontal scaling is not new. This is something that has uh, kind of existed for um, at least a few decades in the, the regular kind of Web2 compute space. So um, in the beginning, a long time ago, I would say in the 90s and early 2000s, um, every system or most systems were kind of single core systems that um, a developer wrote essentially single thread applications for because there weren't really any multiple core systems that they could build applications for, so there was no reason for them to actually multi-thread their applications. So these applications essentially competed for a single fixed resource, um, and uh, single application performances were really bound by what the performance of that single CPU was. And congestion issues uh, definitely existed, because if multiple single-thread applications try to kind of com compete for a single resource, you kind of ran into uh, scalability issues with um, your actual system. So in about 2005-ish um, time period, essentially the first multi-core processor came out, and I think it was technically the Pentium D that was essentially uh, uh, two Pentium 4 cores that were like fused together. And uh, in the beginning, developers didn't really know how to take advantage of a multi-core system. So um, what they essentially did is they took the same applications that they wrote for uh, the single-threaded world um, and uh, essentially just uh, placed them in parallel and got some congestion relief, essentially, and performance from that. Uh, so applications are still competing for um, now mit uh, multiple fixed resources. It's not just one core, it's multiple cores now. And uh, single app performance was still kind of bound by uh, the performance of the singular cores, essentially. And adding cores, you could kind of decrease the congestion, but um, essentially if you just double the number of apps uh, and double the number of cores, you kind of run into the exact same scalability issues. And so what developers did pretty quickly is figure out that they can multi-thread their actual applications. So there was a uh, kind of a developer paradigm shift from writing their entire code in a single-threaded fashion into designing and rewriting their code into a multi-threaded uh, application. And so this is when um, uh, applications starts, started to get faster than uh, a single course performance, essentially, because um, you could essentially uh, assign different threads onto different cores and have parallel computation happen at the same time. And so um, n now instead of applications competing for multiple fixed resources, there were these little threads essentially within each application that were competing for these fixed resources. And um, the single application can now scale um, um, over time. But in the beginning, because the system was still bound by the number of cores that you have, um, adding cores kind of decreased the net congestion, but um, in general it was the same problem as uh, when the multi-core existed in the beginning because essentially um, you still had congestion as you kept adding new applications into the system. So eventually there was these, this kind of new infrastructure that came out, uh, which is elastic scaling. So this is uh, service, cloud services like AWS and uh, different kinds of um, systems out there essentially that allows people to provision you know, kind of almost infinite numbers of cores based on their needs. And as long as your application was already kind of uh, uh, multi-threaded, you could leverage this by um, essentially expanding your application out into almost uh, a, a boundless amount of compute spaces by, and making your system essentially faster that way. And so um, this is kind of the end state of where uh, Web2 is today. Um, most uh, applications on the Web2 world, I would say, does not really have capacity limits uh, because you can have, you can kind of enjoy this as elastic scaling ultimately. You can remove congestion and really kind of scale your, uh, uh, the performance of your application almost infinitely. 
So where are we in Web3 and why are we talking about um, like horizontal scalability? It's because if you take a look at the previous diagram that we mentioned, um, uh, Web3 is kind of in the early stages of it and we can kind of see where the guide's going and we'll, we'll be able to kind of predict how Web3 development will, will, will evolve over time by looking at how things evolved in the Web2 space. So let's take a look. So I would say about two years ago, this is where we were. Um, and this is kind of equivalent to what, what I talked about earlier. So what most application developers are doing is they're, they have a single threaded application um, and they, they deploy it essentially on a monolithic chain, which means that all these different applications were competing for a single monolithic chain essentially. The actual application um, is the performance is capped by the performance of that chain. And there's definitely congestion issues because uh, people are um, competing for the same resource ultimately. When you, um, kind of in the, the, the new thing these days is like layer twos and uh, uh, roll-ups, app chains, et cetera. So with the app chain solution, um, now there's more than one chain that developers can kind of uh, um, deploy on, but the applications are still the same. It, it's in the early days essentially of, uh, 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 similar to the early days of multi-core where Developers haven't really changed their applications to be able to support this kind of multi-threaded uh, and multi-chain world. And so the application remained pretty much the same, but now people are deploying on multiple chains. And, and so the applications are still now competing for multiple fixed resources. Um, single app performance is still bound by essentially the theoretical maximum of that singular chain. And adding chains um, um, you know, decreases the congestion but uh, kind of individually adding chains is kind of annoying, and so uh, congestion still kind of exists ultimately. So this is kind of where we are today. This is the reality of it. So where, where are we going now, right? So if, if you look at the evolution of what happened in Web2, you can kind of guess what's gonna happen. So the next stage in, in Web3 development that developers are gonna have to start evolving into is uh, what I consider multi-threaded uh, Web3 applications. So now, essentially, applications no longer assume that the entirety of your code is gonna be run on a single chain. It's gonna be, the operations are gonna be spread across multiple chains depending on the use cases. So once you start actually developing your applications to assume this kind of multi-threadedness, you can start spreading it out across different infrastructure and start getting scalability this way. So now threads are competing for multiple fixed resources. Um, and single application performance is no longer bound by uh, what is the theoretical maximum of a singular chain. You can kind of start scaling your application out based on the number of chains that exist out there today. Um, adding chains uh, decreases congestion, obviously, but um, you can't really boundlessly add chains out there right now, and so congestion still kind of exists in this paradigm. And so once this developer paradigm shift happens, um, we're gonna see elastic scaling infrastructure essentially come in. And so the idea here is, instead of worrying about, hey, I'm gonna deploy on Ethereum and I'm gonna deploy on Polygon, you can essentially go to a service and say, hey, I want uh, four different chains of this kind of configuration and you'll be able to get uh, um, uh, those chains stood up to have kind of spread out your applications across. And so this is essentially uh, uh, similar to uh, AWS and, and Web2 computation ultimately. So you, you'll be able to spin chains up on demand. Single app chain performance can kind of scale almost infinitely because you're spreading this out across all these different chains. And uh, you can kind of remove congestion entirely from the equation essentially because you have elastic computation in Web3. So, uh, I just talked about horizontal paradigm shift in the developers and eventually it's gonna lead to elastic scalability. Um, what, uh, let's, let's kind of talk about how this actually worked, right? So um, uh, we'll just kind of do a little bit more of a historical view of how, how you actually multi-thread some applications. So if you take a look at the top here, um, you can kind of see, let's say, a, a program that uh, was usually single-threaded, you would kind of run these operations in serial and you need to wait uh, uh, for one to finish before you two starts, and et cetera, et cetera, until the, the, the last of the operations. And when people went to multi-threaded applications, what they do is they essentially have some uh, program that's kind of like the controller program that schedules applications, splits out your, your actual tasks that you need to do, and schedules it into different uh, uh, chains, essentially. And then eventually, once those operations are run across all these different cores, um, it waits until uh, the eighth one finishes, and then when everything is complete, it can clean up the operations ultimately. And so, um, uh, when 
in this paradigm, essentially, you can see that if there's four cores, it's great. But essentially, let's say, instead of uh, there being eight little operations that we have to do, we have to do 800,000 or maybe 8 million transactions, uh, uh, pieces of the little uh, uh, program, then uh, when you only have four of these little cores, you still have to wait a long time, right? So the next kind of iteration of this is elastic scalability. So your little controller application you had now, instead of just doing the scheduling and the, and the cleanup, you actually dynamically spin up uh, um, uh, uh, infrastructure uh, before you schedule it. Um, so let's say, for example, in the eight case, you can kind of dynamically scale up, uh, spin up four cores. But in the case of, uh, let's say, uh, eight million of these little things, you can spin up much, much more than that and get the, the scalability benefits of it. And so now, uh, essentially, your application can dynamically spin up and tear down uh, different uh, infrastructure nodes over time, which gives you the, the, the flexibility to actually scale your application in the way that you want. So this is kind of the end game for Web3, right? Um, before there was the processors, but now it's kind of the change, right? So we want the ability, essentially, for application developers to dynamically spin up these chain infrastructure, schedule a bunch of transactions and operations onto it, and then when they no longer need it, they can kind of clean up their operations and then and, and start tearing down uh, the chains that they don't need. And this is essentially the way that, uh, uh, how Web3 will go based on the history of how uh, computation has evolved over time. And so what do you need to, for this to happen, right? So the first thing, as mentioned, is that developer paradigm shift. So developers need to start writing their applications uh, in a multi-threaded fashion. They need to think about the fact that their actual transactions may no longer be going into one chain. It might be kind of starting to spread out across all these different chains. And how do you actually design this kind of uh, uh, the workflow once that assumption is in place? So that's the first thing that you need. The second thing that you need is uh, an asynchronous cross-chain communication protocol. And this is kind of why we're here at IBC Summit here today because that's exactly what IBC is. So in order for you to spread your actual transactions and all your uh, uh, throughput across all these different chains, you need um, essentially something like IBC to be um, uh, available. And the last thing you need is essentially is a new elastic infrastructure that allows you to spin up and tear down chains on demand. And so today we're gonna talk, of, um, I'm from Saga, and so we're gonna talk about how Saga essentially is an infrastructure project that allows this to happen. So what is Saga? Saga is a chain to launch chains, essentially. So it's a protocol for permissionless, automated, and secure application development uh, deployment. And instead of uh, applications launching on the actual Saga mainnet, which is the, the little blue squares up there, essentially applications all launch on what we call chainlets. And chainlets are single tenant VM blockchains. Um, chainlets, uh, kind of like the Cosmos Hub, is secured through interchain security. So developers don't need to worry about uh, standing up and uh, orchestrating their actual chains. What Saga will do is essentially the validators will automatically uh, uh, spin, uh, spin up these chains essentially as quickly as possible for developers. And the difference between the way that the Cosmos Hub um, interchain security works uh, versus how Saga works is that um, our system essentially allows for permissionless deployment. And so with the Cosmos Hub, you need to go through governance, you need to go through um, a lot of operations to convince the validators to launch your chain. In Saga, everything is permissionless. So um, essentially, uh, the validators really don't, or, or, or the governance doesn't really have a gate into stopping chains from launching automatically. So what's the Saga mainnet? Saga mainnet is, uh, uh, the chain is built on Cosmos SDK and Tendermint Core. Um, um, the, the chain that's that are launched and the Saga chain is automatically interoperable using IBC. And we'll talk about some kind of interesting IBC improvements. Uh, actually, maybe I'll talk about that right now. Um, with Cosmos, um, IBC, there's a lot of uh, um, infrastructure that needs to be in place, like relayers and such, because um, usually two different Cosmos chains or two different chains don't have the same validator sets. But in Saga, every chainlet and every chain has the exact same validator. So, um, in fact, standing on infrastructure for IBC within the Saga ecosystem can be automatic and it can be very, very easy. And so, uh, from our perspective, when someone launches a chain, um, it, it will be essentially automatically interoperable without needing to worry about the relayer architecture, ultimately. And the Saga chain essentially doesn't do anything else. All it does is it launches chains on behalf of customers who put transactions in the chain that says, hey, please launch this chain. There are commands like upgrading and terminating that it supports as well. 
Um, Saga chain, that's essentially, we talked about this. Um, it's a chain that's deployed for uh, uh, um, our developers, essentially. It's a single tenant VM blockchain, um, allows developers to essentially get their own little space that can develop what they want. Um, the chainlets are predictable, they're high performance, and they're not dependent on any other applications, essentially. And so we can actually, one of the things that's really nice about the system, because uh, the only thing that we assume about chainlets is that it's IBC compatible, is that uh, we can launch as many different uh, types of technologies, including different VMs, consensus algorithms, et cetera, that actually supports IBC. And so as mentioned, it's automatically interoperable because everything is uh, um, uh, supported using IBC. So we have kind of announced partnerships with Celestia to do rollups, uh, Polygon for supernets, Avalanche for subnets, and uh, we have some uh, partnerships with Expla and come to us as well to help kind of scale out their chain. Uh, we've had a test net for a while, so um, we mentioned uh, earlier I talked about how we wanted to elastically scale and launch chains on demand. Uh, so our test net uh, has been up for about two months, and in the beginning we did a stress test. We launched about 500 chains in about in a little less than an hour, so which means it's about 10 seconds or so for to launch a chain. And then tearing down essentially is pretty much the same speed. We have about 200 and some uh, projects building on us. Uh, the vast majority of them are, are, are game developers, and uh, uh, our chain is pretty agnostic, but uh, our go-to-market has been in, uh, with the game developers who want kind of like their own chain space. And so um, uh, if you are a builder and you're interested in kind of joining our iterator program, please uh, contact me. Um, I'll, I'll skip this one, actually. So uh, I, I talked about this diagram before, essentially. So uh, essentially, the end state of uh, scalability for Web3 is, is going to need these three things. And this is exactly what Saga kind of directly supports. And the idea here is um, um, uh, based on the user adoption of a specific application, um, Saga can be helpful throughout the entire journey of the, the, the developer. So whether it's in the early days when it's testing time period and you don't have any customers, we can automatically, in, in one click, essentially deploy a chain for you, so you don't have to worry about the infrastructure. Um, we help early adoption because uh, the price of Saga, the point of it is that we are trying to commoditize block space, and so we have low and predictable costs. And then um, once you get to that growth stage, uh, our system is entirely elastically scalable. So essentially, we can support a developer from all the way from the beginning all the way to the end. And we have some kind of nice properties in, 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 uh, listed in these. Uh, at the bottom here. So we just talked about, uh, now that we're done with the shielding part of Saga, <laughs> um, we want to talk a little bit about the kind of fun things you can do with an elastically horizontally scalable system like this. Um, and so uh, one of the things you'll notice is that when you start going horizontal, every application, there's probably almost an infinite numbers of way where you can slice uh, the use case such that you can horizontally scale. We'll show you some examples, but this is definitely only a very small portion of what's possible. So here, here's one example. Um, let's say, for example, I, I'm a developer, and I'm an NFT marketplace, essentially. So what you can do is um, stand up, essentially, infrastructure that supports uh, a, a trading as well as uh, a minting of NFTs. And you can kind of see that, let's say, I, uh, uh, you know, Board Yacht Club and Punks are both on our, uh, on our chain. But there's a lot of traffic on it. So what I'll do is uh, essentially dedicate a separate chain that uh, deals with the minting and the trading of those assets. And I can have a chain essentially that does all other transactions, which is all other um, kind of NFT mints, trading, because there's not, a lot, not a, a lot of volume. But within this chain, maybe there's a game essentially that's using my system. And uh, game one starts getting really, really popular and starts clogging up this other transaction chain, essentially. What I can do is I can spin up dynamically a new chain, um, call it, uh, and, and stick essentially every single game transactions in there. And so you've essentially dynamically increased the number of transactions you can do for just for the entire system. And this is not just one chain. So let's say um, instead of having a small number of NFT mints with game one coming, let's say. Uh, the team wants to do a million chains or a, a million NFTs uh, uh, minting like tomorrow. They can essentially uh, preemptively launch, um, you know, a hundred of these chainlets and get prepared to have the the NFT dot drops kind of in parallel uh, stream across uh, these hundreds of different chains uh, to be able to support the users of the NFT mints essentially. Uh, 
And let's say eventually uh, the mint is done and the game is starting to get less popular. What the game developer can do is then start cleaning up that chain. Uh, so they can put uh, move the state essentially back into the other transaction chain uh, and start tearing down this uh, uh, this chain so that you don't you no longer need to pay for the infrastructure ultimately. Uh, there's many other examples of this. So um, let's say I'm a I'm a Dex and um, we have specific pairs and specific chains. So ETH Uniswap can be on one chain. USDC ETH is another chain, and maybe all other pairs right now is uh, currently in this other pairs chain. You can essentially, let's say one day the new coin demand starts going up, then you can spin up a new chain, new UST, into a different chain, and then when the demand wanes back down, you can kind of move this back. And so you don't want to do this too often because you're going to have to manually move over um, uh, your liquidity, which is uh, a little bit of an operation. Um, but there are technical ways essentially to solve this where maybe your assets are locked actually on a third chain, so you don't have to worry about the liquidity actually moving over in this sense. Uh, some gaming examples, so let's say I'm a, I'm a popular game and uh, I launched uh, on a singular chain at a certain point and I'm finding out that, uh oh, I have a lot of players that are interested in my game, then what I can do is I can actually start segmenting my users into different, uh, the different geographies. So I can launch a chain just for uh, Europe, a chain for Korea, and maybe there's a lot of players in the US, so you launch two chains in the US and maybe you'll split them by US West and US East. And then um, eventually down the line, maybe there's the, 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 the game players become kind of uh, less, uh, uh, it becomes less necessary to have uh, more, more of these chains. So you can kind of spin down US2 and kind of merge them back up if you wanted to. It really depends on the application, uh, how you can kind of spin out horizontally and, 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 and shut them down. Finally, you can, uh, there's one more example that's a little bit different. Um, you can essentially have functional unit segmentation, so you can kind of have a, land, a chain that's really only dedicated to your game logic, um, which, or maybe you can have multiple chains that's dedicated to your game logic. Then there's an NFT chain that just does uh, a kind of minting of NFTs, and then there's a DEX chain within your system. And so all of these operations can be functionally segmented into different buckets and different chains ultimately. So that's uh, kind of a, a few examples of how horizontal scalability can be useful for uh, um, uh, developers for Web3. And I think uh, um, as developers kind of think about optimizing their system, uh, how horizontal scalability can really help with uh, the next steps essentially. So this is a, a QR code essentially to our website if you're a developer, uh, please. Uh, join and uh, let us know, and we'd love to have you guys building on Saga. So, thank you very much.